Well, good morning, everybody. I am excited to be talking to Jesse Dooley, our training coordinator at Vineyard Worship, all the way from Scotland. We are gonna talk about what is worship. This is the conversation we're having. Um, lockdown has prompted us to ask all sorts of wonderful questions. And I think Jesse and I are gonna have a great time just chewing on a few ideas together. So Jesse, firstly, for people that don't know you, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm the worship pastor at the Kingdom Vineyard, which is based in the Kingdom of Fife, which is a little uh, corner of central eastern Scotland. Um, I've been here for 15 years now and originally came from London, where I was uh, born and grew up. And uh, yeah, I don't miss the city at all, especially now especially in 36 degree heat, which they've had yeah. in the last couple of days. Um, but yeah, I uh, spend my time uh, doing a combination of uh, worship oriented and admin oriented tasks for the church and for Vineyard Worship. Brilliant. And we're so glad that you are serving on the Vineyard Worship team. A lot of people will know you through the worship leaders intensives that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And it's been really, really kind of heartbreaking to push pause on those events yeah. because they are just so great. Um, tell us something that you love about our worship intensive gatherings, Jesse. The, the, the worship intensives are uh, great environments because of their size. Um, normally we have sort of between 12 to 15 attendees and that gives room for everybody to have a voice to have a contribution um, but they're really um, great greenhouses for transformation and people just uh, really wrestling with some of the things that um, that motivate us and uh, that really uh, bubble under the surface of the actual activities that we're engaged in as worship leaders. So uh, yeah, they're really great environments for growth and, uh, and encouragement, I've found. So a shout out to all of our worship intensive uh, people. We miss you guys and we hope to be able to do our in-person there's nothing like being together in a room. It's not, it, it, there's no replacement for that, is there? Um, but in the meantime, the conversations keep ticking away, don't they? And the, mm -hmm. the questions and the explorations of uh, what is worship? What does it look like in this season? Um, and so lockdown, here we are. How's it been for you, Jesse? What has this been like for you this season? Gosh, I mean, I, I still have my health and uh, I still have my job and um, and and so actually uh, I'm better off than a lot of people. Um, emotionally, I have to say it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Um, if a roller coaster has more dips than it has climbs, <laughs> if that's even possible. Um, I think we can relate. We know what you're saying. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I know that a lot of people began lockdown with a sense of excitement for the creativity that could emerge from a time of not having to, uh, you know, a, an opportunity to get off the uh, hamster wheel mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of work. But I didn't, I didn't feel any of that. I just spent a lot of time really, um, struggling to get to grips with uh, the the um, the isolation and the mm. and the the separation from people so yeah just as just as things start to change again I feel I've only just gotten used to <laughs> the situation of the last four months so mm. I don't like change that's oh. I guess that's yeah that's an honest thing to say in a movement full of pioneers and people that seem to 
thrive and live off of change. So I'm sure that will be refreshing to somebody watching this thinking, there's one other person in the vineyard who doesn't like change. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, I think some of the conversations that you and I have had have been around the the challenges and the steep learning curve of streaming online services and um, that has taken its toll hasn't it and i'm sure other people feel that way so in my church i'm not at the sharp end of that but you are at the sharp end of um, making these uh, new ways of worshiping actually happen <laughs> yeah and actually get to online from recorded to online and that's been pretty costly hasn't it so would you mind just saying a little bit about that because so many people sure. watching this will will feel the pain of that or maybe they'll have loved it i don't know but yeah maybe um i've at, at the beginning i really just had to learn an entirely new skill set um both uh technically in terms of um how to how to use the technology and um and and make it make it work for other people across the internet but also um as a worship leader and as a preacher learning to deal with the awkwardness of sitting in front of a camera and uh, and not getting any feedback from people uh, that's been a really steep learning curve. And, and I think that actually, because we were in emergency mode, we were so busy figuring out how to do it and how to move uh, what we knew in one location to, um, to this new uh, sort of online experience. We never really had the, the time and the space to ask the question uh, why we were doing it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I feel like now we're only just catching our breath um, and, um, and asking ourselves, recognizing that perhaps we're in this uh, situation for a lot longer than we had anticipated and beginning to ask questions like, or, or I'm certainly beginning to ask questions like, if, um, if we were designing church this way, is this the way we do it? um mm. if um if if this was all we had and all we have mm. then is it doing what we want it to do mm. um, and um not to not to kind of preempt the rest of our conversation but actually i've recently had that com those conversations with my team and and in a large part the answer is yes they are doing what they need to do um but there are there are opportunities now to actually sort of step back and take a breath, reassess. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing right now. That's good. So I think a lot of people that know you know that you are um, a, t a teacher, a worship leader. Mm -hmm. um, some people will know that you are absolutely awesome on the guitar. Um, <laughs> it's maybe a side of you that we don't see quite as much in, in this season. Um, and you were supposed to be teaching at our retreat uh, in, when was that even? Was that March? Feels like a very long time ago. March yeah. And, April, yeah. and um, so that was a big disappointment for all of us not to get together. But um, so you wear a lot of different hats. You're pastoring yeah. in a local context. And so as we talk about what is worship, mm. you are coming at it from a lot of different um angles i think which is yeah. helpful actually but i just wanted to highlight that you are you are a musician and people see you teaching and um preaching a lot at the minute and maybe some of us haven't seen you play and uh, be a part of the band but um talk to us a little bit about your musical experience because i want people to get a little bit of a flavor for that side of you before we start talking about what is worship and our worship values Sure. Um, well, yeah, I was a musician for a long, for a long time before I was a Christian. Um, I grew up um, in a very musical environment, lots of hippies that enjoyed um, uh, rock and roll and everything, um, sort of uh, psychedelic and uh, 
I, I grew up jamming, you know, with a lot of people. So um, I've always loved music. Uh, I'm also trained classically on the piano. So I sort of- I didn't actually know that. Quite eclectic um, musically. And then um, becoming a Christian and finding that music was a big life, part of the life of a Christian was, um, it was really just a natural move for me to, to get involved in that. Um, and I just uh, really uh, have always known that music is a way of expressing oneself in a way that is impossible otherwise. Mm. And, and so it made sense to me to use music uh, for the glory of God. Um, it made sense to me that um, that I would use my guitar as a as a as a mouthpiece for prayer. Mm. Um, so, yeah. And just yesterday, I was um, you know jamming on my guitar to completely um, heathen uh, rock track that I enjoy. <gasps> <laughs> controversial and, um, and and yet it was uh, for me a, a spiritual experience it was um it was something that um that sort of brought up out of me that which i can't i don't have words for so um so for sure music is a big part of me you use that phrase, it makes, it made sense to me. Well, having heard you play, it makes sense to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I affirm that, that made sense. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good call. Um, <laughs> so so you're, you're coming at this conversation of what is worship mm -hmm. as someone who has been a musician for some time and you have pastored and worship pastored in the local church for a number of years. You've been teaching and training worship leaders. You have a lot of young worship leaders coming through your door uh, in your community, being right next to a university. So um, you have a lot of, of experience. And um, I think I would love just to maybe start with, what, what do you think worship is? And then we'll talk about values, but what, what is worship? Yeah, it's it's such a difficult question to know how to begin to answer. Um, and, I, and I have been thinking about this. And I think if you asked me at different times, I would come up with different answers. Sure, but, right, of course, yeah. but right now, I, I think that worship is, um, is, is when all things begin to uh, to find their right place hmm. uh, where order is restored uh, where by which I mean God's order um, I think worship is what happens when uh, God and creation are in relation to one another as they ought to be uh, with with God as sovereign and uh, and ruler and father and king and uh, and we are his subjects made to give him glory mm -hmm. and so that obviously has its manifestations in 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 all sorts of different ways um, from everything to uh, explicitly giving him <clears throat> uh, the honor and the praise and the glory that he deserves, but also to, um, to relating to one another as, uh, as we are supposed to. So I see um, worship as being essentially encapsulated in the, in the two greatest commandments as Jesus preached them, to love God, um, and to love one another. So everything being restored, everything in its right place. Great answer. So <laughs> the reason why we're actually asking some of these 
theological and philosophical questions is that we are faced with the quandary of what is worship when we either can't mm -hmm. sing or only one person at the front can sing and the rest of us sort of engage silently or whatever worship looks like and will look like in the near future you know so where does singing fit into that yeah that's that's a good question well clearly singing is something that god loves uh he um you knew we were going to end up talking about revelation but in the in the in, in, in the in the throne room scene in revelation um around the throne is worship and singing so he clearly enjoys it um and throughout the scriptures there is just uh, not just exhortations to sing but sometimes commands to sing um and so it seems to me that singing is a kind of non-negotiable part of worship um, as in terms of our act of worship but if worship does take on that broader uh, meaning where all things come into right relation with one another then given the peculiarities of the situation we currently find ourselves in i think worship looks like not singing um, because if singing and of course we've we've just got to go by our best judgment haven't we but if singing is indeed a um, um a cause of greater infection uh for this what is actually in some cases in many cases a deadly disease then to love one another means not doing that mm -hmm. um so so we do find ourselves in a quandary because we're commanded to sing and yet um and yet we need to interpret that through the lens of um you know god's love for one uh, mm -hmm. for us and our need to um to be images of that love to one another and so right now i think it means not singing in groups together which is hard for us who love to sing isn't it and, Very hard. Um, it, it feels it feels like a like a loss and a sacrifice to to not be able to do that yeah um, and you're saying, I love what you're saying about things coming into order and right relationship. Um, it strikes me that you're saying God loves singing. He invented it. It was his idea, wasn't it? But there's yeah. also times when he says to the prophets, <laughs> who were yeah. a particularly interesting lot, some of them, but get away with the noise of your song and your festivals. So there are times it seems that God doesn't love our singing quite as much as other times. <laughs> he seems to enjoy it more. So in Revelation, it seems to be <laughs> a really good thing. But there yeah. are other places in the Bible when he doesn't seem to be as delighted with our yeah, songs. Absolutely. He, he loves it in situations where um, the heart which is being expressed through song is right. You know, in that throne room scene, there are people who are taking their crowns and they're casting them down before him. So there's, th th there is in that environment, worship as, um, as creation in order and uh, relationship between God and those whom he has created uh, be being, um, healthy and uh, interacting in the way that it was created to be but where singing is actually done in lieu of doing the right thing mm -hmm. when it is actually done um, at the exclusion of uh, the heart which is supposed to um, express worship in that sense of things being in its right place relationship being in the right order well no you can't you can't say um with your lips one thing and do something else entirely with the rest of your life mm 
Mm. Um, God just isn't going to have that. He's he, he's going to see right through it. Um, and you're going to realize that the song actually isn't the thing. Mm. Uh, the, the, the song isn't the thing he, he loves. The, it's where the song is coming from. That's what he loves. Mm. So what would you say this season is about? Gosh. In terms of that right relationship, that restoration of order, like what, and we can't sing necessarily, or mm. in, our, in our situation in Northern Ireland, we could, but our community is choosing not to right. um, for a season. So what, yeah. what, what, what could our response be? I don't want to say should. I don't want to put a should on anyone um, through this conversation, oh. but what, what would be a good response in yeah, terms of, 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 of entering into the kind of worship, the vision that you're describing from Revelation? Gosh, I, th I think part of it has to be a willingness to, to just put it down mm -hmm. for a while, you know, just, just acknowledging that, for a season, it's something we cannot have. Um, and there are so many people all around the world that face uh, uh, situations where they cannot have what they would like to have. Yeah, so actually, th this this is re this is really a luxury that we um, we we have the possibility of choosing to do it, but we um, but the right thing to do seems to be to choose not to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that one, one, of the, one of the responses is simply to just lay it down and just say, um, for, so, for a season like this, we forego what we have sometimes called our right to do what we want mm. and that is really hard but i think that god actually is using this time to strip away uh, where we've invested in things that are secondary or um you know, ex expressions of the heart that still are important, but the heart goes on, doesn't it? Isn't that a Celine Dion song? Oh, <laughs> Please sing it for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, the heart must go on. Yeah. <laughs> Celine Dion in her profound theological wisdom. <laughs> It's a surprising place that we went there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Foresee that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's an opportunity to actually sort of, um, you know, when St. John of the Cross talked about the dark night of the soul, he, he described it in terms of seasons that we go through where we're no longer blessed with some of the sort of, um, the, uh, the good experiences of, being uh, a child of God, you know some of the um, some of the joys, some of the great uh, privileges that we experience, um, so that God can teach us that He Himself is enough. Mm. That worship can still and must still happen, even without all its trappings. When everything is stripped away, he is still God, and I am still made to worship. So we've got to figure it out. We've got to figure it out um, what worship looks like without this. Good. Yeah, so that leads very nicely into the next part of the conversation. You have done a lot of work around our values, and you and I together have t tried to... Uh, lay out what is our vineyard liturgy um, yeah. what does it look like to worship in the vineyard and what are the values behind that and um, 
all of that has been there, but we just have tried to kind of compile it and present it in a way that people that are just new to the vineyard or trying to figure out worship can access. Yeah. You've created some fabulous video resources, which anyone can find on our website and our YouTube channel. And then a really helpful booklet kind of as a companion to that. So we've done a lot of work on our values. Now what? <laughs> what yeah, happens yeah. to our values now? Yeah, well, I, I really hope that I'm um, I'm not the only person responsible for asking that, uh, answering that question. Um, <laughs> we're uh, starting with you. <laughs> yeah, we're, <laughs> but um, yeah, the 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 fact that we can't sing together, where singing has formed such a large portion of our liturgy, um, almost forces us to go where I. Um, where I'm always encouraging people to go anyway, which is to look at the why behind the what. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm really um, not interested in doing something simply because it's the way it's always been done. Um, so what I've what I've always been interested in. And, and as a person, I've always been interested in between, uh, interested in the machinery behind, you know, peering behind the curtain to see what what things look like. Even as a musician in studios, I've always been interested in the engineering that goes on behind the mixing desk, as much as I am as rocking out in in the guitar booth. Um, but I I want to know um, why our liturgy should look a certain way and I know that I think all liturgy ultimately is a matter of preference and once we acknowledge that once we acknowledge that it's just what we like to do um, then we can stop judging the way other churches like to do worship their way and we can start thinking about um, whether behind that preference there is some deeper meaning, deeper reason why uh, why we should continue to do the things that we're doing and why we should continue to call it worship. You know, is it actually worship or is it just, you know, us having a good time? Mm, um, that's a good question. Yeah. And and so my my hope is is not that we just dismantle everything, uh, although situ circumstances have caused us by necessity to dismantle everything. I don't want to tear everything down just for the sake of it. Like I said, I'm not particularly fond of change for its own sake. Um, uh, but I do want to know why it's worth it. Mm -hmm. what, what's yeah. the point? Mm -hmm. What's the point of doing it one way rather than another way? Um, so for people that are watching this that don't maybe know the values right off the top of their head, give right. us a little summary of vineyard worship values, just in case someone sure. is saying you're going, what are you talking about? Sure. Well, we uh, in the UK maybe express them slightly differently in a slightly vari variable way to the rest of the world, but we've dis we've we've described them using the words intimacy, integrity, accessibility, kingdom expectation, and passion. And I always say when I teach the values that there's no hierarchy or order of importance to those values, but intimacy is the most important. Amen to that. Uh, so um, those, those aren't um, the product of a committee uh, sitting around the table, deciding that this is what vineyard worship is going to look like. They're more sort of, uh, it's just language to describe what happened when the vineyard was born and as it's continued to grow. Um, and it's language that I find helpful because um, 
it does actually have those theological underpinnings that mm. that then give rise to worship looking a certain way or sounding a certain way that's good that's helpful okay so that's the the nutshell version if anyone yeah. wants to unpack those further we've got all those resources available so those are the values and how do we apply them in this season can you give us some i know you're not you don't have all the answers. Neither one of us want to sit here and pretend like we know exactly what to do in a pandemic because yeah. we've never we've never been through one before. We don't actually know, but uh, you th you think about these things a lot. I'm sure you've been praying mm -hmm. about it and seeking the Lord for your own community. Yeah. What are your thoughts right now today? They might they might change by next sure. week, but today, um, in the middle of August, what are you thinking? Yeah, um, I, I know that uh, one of the very first things I had to wrestle with was, um, was this odd sense of um, people getting a, almost a window into my private worship life when I was having to leave worship in front mm -hmm. of a camera and it was just me in the room. It, it felt very um i felt very exposed and um and i didn't i didn't like that but um it, it by me by which i mean it wasn't comfortable um but i do see it now as a sense in which um the value of intimacy has has kind of now um sort of broadened itself not just so that it's intimacy between me and the lord but there's a kind of intimacy that's being experienced now even between those members of the church that are participating in those worship sets mm -hmm. where they're seeing me vulnerable in a way that they haven't done before mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that causes others that are participating mm -hmm. to um I don't know, open themselves up, reveal themselves more to God and to one another. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's one of the things that has really challenged me in this time. Integrity, um, not to blow my own horn, but integrity has never been that challenging for me. In fact, it's probably been more challenging for other people around me because basically by integrity, I mean, we say what we mean and we mean what we say. And I've never been very good at pretending to feel or think one thing. Um, uh, and so I've, I've been honest and, and quite open throughout this whole experience that I have found this really hard and really upsetting and really confusing and um and while i see everybody on social media um kind of either posting the incredible productivity that uh that lockdown has has produced or um theologizing about all the the things that god is um doing through the through and with the pandemic i've just been in a bit of a stew just kind of um saying i i know how i feel and i don't know how to deal with this um but actually in terms of worship i've i've got friends in the bible <laughs> because they seem to worship with exactly the same ethos with the sense that we don't need to pretend to have it all together we don't need to um uh come to any kind of neat conclusions theologically before we come to worship we can come to god with our help uh what the heck is going on um I'm confused, I'm troubled, I'm upset, I'm lonely, I'm all, all of these things, we can say these things in worship. And so, um, and so I've, I, I found a 
deeper connection with the the, the lamentation language of scripture mm. um, through this time, particularly during the period of exile, where, like us, their entire structure of worship had been torn away from them, mm. and they were still and they were trying to work out anew what it meant to be worshippers without all the structures that they had been familiar with. Mm. Good. We could spend a whole hour just talking about that, couldn't we? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that's integrity. Um, what, do you want to say anything about the uh, some of the other? Yeah, sure. I mean, passion. I, I, a lot of what I've said and written about passion um, is is trying to um, reframe the idea of passion, uh, not as something which is just an over expression of enthusiasm for something, mm -hmm. although it can, of course, be that. Mm -hmm. uh, passion at its root is the thing that we are absolutely determined to do, whatever the cost. Mm -hmm. And so passion in worship right now just looks like being determined to carry on, being determined to give God the glory. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and as I say, bringing, uh, working to bring everything into its right order mm. and then what else have we got um kingdom expectation we still expect to see god move even dare i say to rid the world of this virus mm. you know so we pray big prayers and we pray, pray small prayers we we continue to pray for god's kingdom to break through um, and that's that's not changed at all. And then accessibility, perhaps the hardest value to actually sort of do something with right now. Um, but it's just trying to make sure that everybody gets to play, that somehow that that we're not. One, one of the greatest dangers in this whole online church experience is is that um, church ministry again sort of reverts to the professionals mm -hmm. the uh um the, the clergy mm -hmm. and that the laity are just uh consumers who observe what is going on and so we've got to find ways to engage people we've got to find ways to um to to make this a family thing uh, so yeah those are the, those are the challenges of right now i think have you found any ways are you trying any what are you doing to try and engage people in this season yeah one of the um one of the ways we we do a, a combination of pre-recorded stuff and live stuff for uh sundays and with the pre-recorded stuff we've we've we try to spread that out as much as possible so that we're seeing different faces um diff hearing different voices as much as possible um, from a worship leading point of view and a preaching point of view, we're, you know, we're trying different things in terms of doing pre-recorded stuff or doing um, stuff like Zoom calls where you can actually see the, uh, the responses of people. But we're also trying to, um, to make this stuff as widely accessible outside of our existing family because that's another opportunity that has presented itself we've we've had the opportunity now of putting church on a platform where people don't need to walk through the door to actually participate and see what we're all about so we're making contact with people we've never made contact with before mm. so accessibility is yeah it's looking all sorts of different ways right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably the fact that the majority of our movement in the UK and Ireland have all rapidly shifted to an online presence, even yeah. though uh, some of us would sooner die <laughs> right. than worship right. in front of a camera, you know, or preach to your iPhone. Um, I think that says something about our. Uh, just our the, the DNA and the values and the ability ability that we have to be flexible and be nimble and just and I think on on that front yeah. accessibility we have done 
very well. Just just going online is a a step towards trying to be accessible to people in their homes. Yeah, absolutely. And the challenge there is is not to become so good at this <laughs> that we um, that we morph into sort of TV channel um, culture where um, where again it's it's just an us and them dynamic rather than a family that's actually just trying to trying to make do with the fact that we can't be together right now mm-hmm. so, yeah. yeah it's pretty comfortable sitting on my settee in my dressing <laughs> gown with my pancakes you know on a Sunday right. morning not having to speak to anyone and you know right do any heavy lifting or any of that stuff, get up early, you know, there's something very comfortable and convenient about it, which we can easily settle into, which be a a challenge, but one, one challenge at a time here. So at the minute, I think we're doing, we're doing really well overall. And I think, you know, we've talked a little bit in some of our webinars about that piece of intimacy and how actually as a tribe of worship leaders, we were pretty well prepared to mm-hmm. go into that space of all of a sudden I'm leading from my living room, you know, and, and I think maybe along with what you're saying with the online presence, I think that the challenge might be the longer we do this is to not just make this the next hamster wheel you're talking about. Sure. Initially, we were excited to get off the hamster wheel, but actually yeah. this has become for some people already could become for some of us yeah. a hamster wheel and another place to perform. And I think, you know, one of one of the questions that we're asking as worship leaders is how on earth do we measure engagement? You know, That's and it can't good. just be the likes on our Facebook page and mm-hmm. our number of views. So how do we measure engagement? So have you thought about that at all? Is that how are you how are you dealing with that within yourself? Because we're so used to the immediate response of either negative or positive. Maybe people look bored out of their minds when we're leading yeah. them in worship. But usually we're like, we can see the presence of the Lord on, on people. Absolutely. And we can feel that unity in the room. And, you know, I'm not always united with myself when I'm leading worship. <laughs> I don't have to say feeling you know it's and it's yeah. hard to read what's happening you know in another absolutely someone else's house yeah i, I how, how am i doing with that not very well <laughs> to be honest <laughs> thank you for um, being honest um it's it has become uh clear to me how much i depend upon uh some kind of positive feedback um and it's really difficult um you know i don't want to beat myself up about that too much and i don't want to beat other people up about it either because you know as as soon as we realize that the 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 fear is that oh gosh i've i've slipped into people pleasing uh Mm -hmm mode here and and actually uh what i need to learn to do is um is to be able to function completely independently mm. of um of how people are responding but i it the the there has to be a sweet spot somewhere in the middle there right right where um because we are serving people we're not just doing this um to please people we're doing it because um uh, of that accessibility value we're trying to bring people together moving in the same direction singing the same songs so you know declaring the same truths um bringing all our multiple voices into one voice and so it's really hard uh to get that sense of togetherness Mm -hmm. um in this situation so there's a both and you know a classic classic vineyard sort of radical middle somewhere in the somewhere in the middle of as worship leaders uh, as a worship leader trying to learn how to um 
how to continue serving without the luxury of that positive feedback that I get mm -hmm. or negative feedback, you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there's negative feedback. Um, learning how to function as a worship leader without that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but not actually denying the, the real value of, um, of having that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, if indeed we are wanting to do this thing as family. Yeah. I said to someone recently, I didn't set out to do this thing of worship leading to sing by myself. Right. I'm a worship leader because I want to sing with others and I want other people to find their voice. And it's really, really hard to measure whether that is yeah. still happening. And um, it's a whole new level of trusting the Holy Spirit. And you do get some feedback, but it's, it feels far more detached and it does. separate. Yeah. Like it might as well be happening on the other end of the world versus, yeah. you know, in, within my own city. So, um, yeah, so it's a, it is a challenging time for us as worship leaders. Mm -hmm. it, it has been really difficult. And many of us are really exhausted and have worked really hard. And I think Jesse, you and I both would love to say to people, well done for persevering, Absolutely. for showing up. You know, Jesse's sitting here sharing that it hasn't been easy for him. I'm saying I've never been so exhausted in my life. You know, I work mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, half the, by Wednesday, it feels like it, <laughs> it should be Friday every single week. Right. Um, right. So I think there there's a level of, of exhaustion, of sacrifice and surrender in this season. Absolutely. There's the great uncertainty. And you know, we are all we are all wrestling with that as worship right. leaders. But over overall what we're hearing, I think, at Vineyard Worship is so encouraging um, because of the character and the perseverance and the risk taking. And I would love to just circle back around to the values and talk mm -hmm. a little bit about innovation and yeah. give people permission to to look at those values to look at how we've done worship in the vineyard for like only a couple decades really i mean right. we're still babies right, right. the movement we're still yeah. babies um so what can you say to uh, to kind of push us along a little bit you know i know we're tired yeah. this isn't a pressure thing but just a little bit of a nudge like you are free to innovate here with these values absolutely and um and and we need people to innovate um the thing that happens when um when we continue to do things a certain way without actually examining why we did them that way in the first place, the thing that happens is um, things begin to fossilize and, um, and, uh, and eventually that leads to death. And, um, and if, we, if we don't want to die as, <laughs> um, as, as a church movement, we need to, um, examine the what sorry examine the why behind the what so if we look at the values and and re-examine them then my hope is that out of that soil would grow completely new and um and hitherto unseen forms of worship and like i said i'm not interested in tearing stuff down for its own sake but I am interested in seeing what those new shoots look like, yeah. um, especially as, um, as, as we find ourselves at a point of history where I think people will be talking about for a long time afterwards. And I wonder what people will say about the worship that emerges from out of this period. And I hope it will be something along the lines of, um, whatever it looks like people rediscovered their passion people rediscovered intimacy and integrity and kingdom expectation and all of those things whatever whatever that looks like it might look exactly the same um but if we did if we determine from here on out 
to do exactly the same thing, then it will look exactly the same. It just won't have a beating heart behind it. But if we determine to step out as worshippers who, who are seeking to express these values, then it may look completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably, um, you know, I'm, I'm turned 40, I don't know how many years ago, like a couple of years ago. I need to, <laughs> I need to always work it out on my fingers how old I am. That's how old I am. But um, I, I think that um, the people who are really going to change things are, the, are people that, that are younger than me. I'm a little bit set in my ways. Um, like I said, I don't like change. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but I'm, but I'm, I'm willing to serve the vision of doing worship that pursues these values. And so if somebody were to say to me, let's try this, then I'd, I'd go, I'd go with it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I, I guess what I'm, my project in examining and teaching the values is really to inspire those innovators, those entrepreneurs, those, um, those people who are a little bit less risk averse than I am mm -hmm. um, to try new things, to attempt to, um, to express these values in ways that we've not yet seen. That's and so, so and so help our movement to, um, to continue to thrive rather than simply survive. Mm -hmm. That is so good. That is so, so good. I love, I love what you're saying there. And I think it would be really wonderful to actually finish with you praying for us. And I know we're saying kingdom expectation is still, yeah. it's still the same value, even though it doesn't look like us being in a room together at a retreat, we are on a zoom call and people will watch this whenever they watch it. But I, I we're not just having these conversations to fill our time, are we? Absolutely. We no. still believe that the Holy Spirit is going to empower people. And the thing is, in the vineyard, we don't want to innovate for the sake of innovation. It's not about being Precisely. trendy, and that's not what you're saying at all. No. It's not about having, you know, the flashiest thing and um, becoming the, the renowned celebrity in the, you know, Christian circles we have enough celebrities but anyway that's a different topic but yeah. I, I i i feel that we we need the wind of the holy spirit and and we don't want to just push through our exhausted overwhelmed uncertain selves mm -hmm. um for the sake of it we want to be led by the spirit but the spirit uses people that are at the edge and right. <laughs> overwhelmed and yeah. exhausted and um don't understand the times that they live in, you know, mm. or are young and immature. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, right. this, this, this is, I mean, you referred to your friends in the Bible. I mean, the, the, it's all over those pages, isn't it? Like the most yeah. unqualified and um, <laughs> unexpected person, you know, bec becomes the person that God is going to use to um, do a new thing with his people um, yes. and to bring his kingdom to people who don't know him yet. So all, all of that said, I would love for you to yeah. pray and uh, yeah. we pray expectantly that yeah. the Holy Spirit will move as we pray. So yes. please pray for us, Jesse. Well do. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that whatever uh, changes, you remain the same God, worthy of worship, mm. honor and glory. And we simply, as those whom you have created to worship, want to, um, want to do that in spirit and in truth. And we confess that we find the situation as it is right now, confusing and disarming and we ask you, Lord, to inspire us afresh. What is it to be a worshipping community at this time and going forward? 
We ask that of you, Lord, and we pray that you would provide the answer. Holy Spirit, I pray that you uh, give those of us who are a little bit longer in the tooth and a little bit set in our ways, would you give us the grace to seek out and to accept the experimentation of those who are uh, prepared to experiment with ways of worship that we have not yet seen before. I pray that you'd cause up to cause to rise up those people who uh, for whatever reason have been silenced uh, up until now. Those of ethnic minorities, those who are women who have been disqualified simply because of being a woman. Mm. The young, even children, Lord, would you cause all of these people to, um, to rise up and show us what it means to worship in this time? Would you, by the wind of your Holy Spirit, breathe life into vineyard worship once again? Mm. And especially, Lord, at this time, would you, uh, would you show us what it means to worship simply in terms of loving you well and loving one another well, to seek you and to seek justice and mercy and compassion in the relationships that we have with those around us because lord this is the worship that you seek in the name of jesus we pray amen oh jesse that was so good and especially the invitational aspect of you know if if you feel like you don't quite fit in the vineyard for whatever reason, there is room and the values oh, yeah. are not about gender or race or, you know, this is the whole innovation thing. I think there is a connection there. Um, and yeah. So I think that's really, really encouraging. Thank you for your prayer. Thank you for your honesty and your vulnerability today. Thank you for your faithfulness to your local community but also on a wider level and we really hope that we will get to hear those talks that you were supposed to deliver <laughs> at the retreat at some stage in the future and um, yeah. thank you for your time jesse we just really appreciate you and all the work that you do my thank pleasure you so much. thank you